we welcome you to the Knowledge Cities World Summit. On behalf of the World Capital Institute and the College of Communication and Information of the University of Puerto Rico in Rio Piedras. I am Dr. Eliud Flores Caraballo, Director of KCWS 2022, Professor at the College of Communication and Information and member of the Executive Committee of the WCI. Welcome all, bienvenidos y bienvenidas. This is the 15th edition of the KCWS, which for the first time is hosted in Puerto Rico. The title of this year's conference is Actionable Knowledge for the Anthropocene. During the next three days, we will endeavor to explore analysis and concrete solutions to tackle pressing problems for the planet and humanity. Each day of the conference is dedicated to a different main theme. Today, we will address climate and planetary emergencies. Tomorrow, we will examine how islands' economies are turning towards knowledge ventures beyond the tourism economy. And on Friday, we will discuss knowledge perspectives for urban development and societal challenges in the post-truth era. KCWS 2022 features more than 50 speakers, academics, policymakers, and practitioners from multiple disciplines and regions of the world. We are proud to share with you that over 250 people from all around the planet have registered for the conference. And we look forward to getting input from all attendees during the Q&A sessions. Please write in the chat or use the reaction button on the meeting control bar to upload or select the emoji that best represents your reaction to the speaker as they are talking. You may also raise your electronic hand to request to open your mic during the Q&A period of each session. We decided to make KCWS 2022 more inclusive, and thus we made this a bilingual conference. The sessions uh, held during the first half of the day, morning for us, will be conducted in English and the sessions during the second part of the day will be conducted in Spanish. Let me close with a couple housekeeping items. Please bear in mind that we are conducting all sessions on the Microsoft Teams platform, and that you may enable closed captions to better understand our speakers. If you join with the Microsoft Teams app, you can also enable live translation of the captions in multiple languages. Look over the instructions we emailed uh, to you beforehand for more information on how to use these features. Do remember that each session of KCWS 2022 has a unique link. They are all posted on the conference program on the website which we have sent you many times before, but I remind you is FACI, F-A-C-I dot U-P-R-R-P dot E-D-U slash K-C-W-S 2022. And there you can navigate to the program. We will issue a conference participation certificates to all attendees. You must register on the conference website to receive the certificate. We love having you all at the Knowledge Cities World Summit 2022. I trust that it will feed your intellect and warm your heart. Muchas gracias. We now invite Dr. Jorge Santiago Pintor, Dean of the College of Communication and Information of the University of Puerto Rico in Rio Piedras to take this stage to offer you his welcome message. Dr. Santiago Pintor. Thank you. Good morning to all speakers and participants of the Knowledge of City World Summit 2022. 
the dissertation under the theme Knowledge and Action for the Anthropocene. The College of Communication and Information is honored to receive more than 50 speakers from countries such as Mexico, Nigeria, Holanda, España, United States, Brazil, Argentina, Venezuela, Alemania, Austria, Inglaterra, Japón, Colombia, y Uruguay. Speaker, participants, researchers, graduate students, entrepreneurs, and public policymakers from different countries gathered together to share a knowledge, innovation, and successful practice to promote, from a multidisciplinary standpoint, the construction of the future that is in urban and planetary, equitable to present and future generations. There are two reasons why this year's conference edition should be highlighted. This is the first time that the conference originates that the Caribbean region and present in two languages, Spanish and English. It is an initiative to broaden and promote a productive exchange between diverse group of speakers who, who will be presenting for their enjoyment and attendees participating in this event. In addition, this is the first time that the call for people will integrate graduate students that will be sharing their work and research projects. This action amplify and promote the diversity, approximation of geographic, cultural, and scientific content center of a complex problem that all that affect all to us: the climate change, the planetary emergency, and others. I would like to thank the World Capital Institute President, Dr. Francisco Javier Carrillo Gamboa, as well as the Organization Executive Committee. And, and I will also like to recognize the Titanic Endeavor Executive by Professor Elius Flores and all the faculty members and students from our college that work timely and diligently to organize this event. This conference is a tool that will be the sorry that will apply amplify our knowledge so we can establish and adopt concrete action target to promote the better balance for the urban and planetary future. Say thank you for all allowing us to host this event. Please enjoy these three days of knowledge exchange. Welcome and thank you all. Thank you for your kind words, uh, Dean Santiago Pintor, and for the support you and your staff have provided to make KCWS 2022 a reality. Uh, we couldn't have done it uh, without your support. Thank you so much. Okay, so let's move now to our keynote lecture on climate challenges and opportunities for cities by Dr. David Dudman. Dr. David Dodman is the General Director of the Institute for Housing and Development Studies at Erasmus University, Rotterdam in the Netherlands. He holds an undergraduate degree from the University of St. Andrews and a doctorate from the University of Oxford. David was a coordinating lead author in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, six assessment report and has played a leading role in international and collaborative research program. Dr. Dolman has advised a wide range of governments and international organizations as well. And now it is my pleasure to cede the microphone to Dr. David Dolman. Welcome, David. Good morning, and let me share my screen. Um, Elliot, can you confirm that this is all being seen clearly? Looks great. Good, that's what I like to hear. Great. Good morning, everybody. Buenos dias y muchas gracias por la invitación a hablar en esta conferencia. Thank you very much for the um, kind invitation to, um, to participate. Um, I'm particularly um, pleased to 
see the connection to the Caribbean and the challenges that the region faces. Although I am now based in the Netherlands, my um, my childhood and the start of my career was in Jamaica. I um, spent several very happy years as a lecturer in the um, in urban geography at the University of the West Indies in Kingston. Um, I'm particularly pleased as well for the theme of today um, being on um, climate and um, uh, planetary emergencies. Um, as an urban geographer and as someone who works at a urban development institute, um, I'm obviously very see, see the importance of cities, both as the sites at which um, the climate emergency is experienced, um, and also as the locations in which the um, key responses <clears throat> to the climate emergency need to take place. <clears throat> I speak to you in many ways wearing two hats. Um, the first is from my position as General Director of IHS, the Institute for Housing and Urban Development Studies. Um, I have only been here for a couple of months. Before that, I, I worked at the International Institute for Environment and Development, IIED, an independent uh, research institute in, in London. Um, I was very pleased to move to IHS in Rotterdam because of the three pillars of the organization's work around education, advisory and research that contributes to cities that are livable and just and sustainable. Um, and it's a very international setting. Um, we have um, students from more than 47 different countries this year. Um, and if you don't know about IHS, I hope this is an opportunity for you to, to find out and to explore potentials for synergies and collaboration and sharing. I'm also very clearly wearing the hat of an intergovernmental panel on climate change, IPCC coordinating lead author. And the conference's focus on actionable knowledge really does resonate here. The IPCC is a group of scientists who have been charged with the responsibility um, of synthesizing um, the key scientific findings around all aspects of climate change as the basis for um, as the basis for um, guiding the uh, responses that are put in place by the UNF. Triple C, the Framework Convention on Climate Change, including through the COPs like COP27 that is um, taking place right now. Um, and the sixth assessment report of the IPCC has been released between 2021 and the final sections will be in early 2023. Um, and the key messages are very clear. Climate change is a threat to human well-being and the health of the planet, and that there is only a brief rapidly closing window to secure a livable future. And in the previous assessments of the IPCC, um, there sometimes has been more or less focus on urban dimensions. What we find is um, that in the sixth assessment, we finally have a very strong recognition. The impacts of climate change are magnified in cities where more than half of the world's population lives. So in that regard, the link between cities, knowledge and global challenges that this conference is examining seems incredibly both important and very, very timely. So what I'm going to talk about in the next 40 or 45 minutes or so is some of the different dimensions of the challenge that are faced in cities, the climate challenges, but also the broader framework in which the climate challenges take place because of course changes in climate don't take place in a vacuum. They take place alongside um, the processes of urbanization, which um, for those of us who um, work particularly in uh, Latin America, Africa, Asia, have seen or do see as a very rapid process of transforming both the social lives of people, the economic drivers of human life, um, and also a process of significant land use and environmental change. So the first element of the challenge here 
is the challenge of an urbanizing world. The other challenges that we face take place against the backdrop of the conversion of land use from uh, non-urban to urban uses, the conversion of livelihoods from uh, predominantly agricultural to um, manufacturing and service-based activities, and the massive demographic changes, particularly that are taking place and will be taking place um, in Asia and Africa in the coming decades. So how do we deal with the other challenges that are being thrown at us in the context of rapid urbanization? And of course, this rapid urbanization is not taking place in the same way, in the same place in all over the world. And so it's a process that is um, uneven urbanization and unequal urbanization. So the uneven urbanization we can see in the top left corner, the purple or magenta dot, are the places where we see the most rapid changes in urban population being expected from 2015 to 2030. Of course, there are some pockets in North America and Australasia, um, but the vast majority of cities that are going to be growing at these very high rates, doubling times of 9, 10 or 12 years, um, are in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, Middle East and North Africa, and South and Southeast Asia. And we know as well that these are the locations where the financial capacities and often the technical capacities that are required to address the challenges of urbanization are also most limited. And so the figure at the bottom um, shows, gives some examples of the city budget per capita for a range of cities around the world. And we can see cities like New York, Singapore, Yokohama um, have really significant um, uh, budgets per capita in those cities, nine or $10,000 um, per year per capita. Well, many of the cities where we see the most rapid growth rates, if we look to the left, um, Accra, Mombasa, Nairobi, Lagos, are cities where there is very, very limited investment capacity. So city budgets per capita can be almost 10,000 a year or less than, one or less than $100 um, per year. Um, and that creates a setting in which we're going to have to deal with the challenges of climate change. A lot of my own work has focused particularly on um, informality. Um, and we know that um, informal settlements are those where that are outside the formal system for recording land ownership and tenure and that don't meet a range of regulations relating to planning, land use, built structures, health and safety. Um, and this is both a considerable absolute number of people getting close to a billion people worldwide and also a very high proportion of the urban population, particularly in South Asia and even more so um, in sub-Saharan Africa. So informality presents a range of additional challenges. The scale, the number of people who are, who are going to be living in informal settlements, um, the quality of the built environment, particularly around access to basic services, which are essential for health and well-being, um, the absence or very limited provision um, of adequate piped water, sanitation, risk reduction, risk reducing infrastructure, um, the quality of the built environment, which means that um, fire can spread very rapidly. And indeed, in many African informal settlements, fire is one of the most significant challenges that people are facing. Um, the quality of the living environment, which is um, uh, encourages the or enables the spread of um, disease. I'm just trying to see um, if there is, a, I see a, a flashing comment, but I don't think I need to pay attention to, um, to it. No. Okay. And um, so we, um, there's also then the issue around in informality around where people who are refugees and internally displaced people live. Um, and we've moved in a global situation from, uh, from many or most refugees and displaced people living in dedicated refugee camps. We now find that the majority of refugees and displaced people live in cities. 
how can we provide services both in the current situation where there's often inadequate services for the host population, but particularly um, in the context of future changes in climate and the future changes in the hazard um, environment to these people who are moving into cities as a result of threats and challenges that they face elsewhere. Of course, there's another climate challenge, um, and that's to do with um, the contribution that people have made to climate change and the inequity between the source of the drivers of climate change and where climate impacts are felt most severely. So this is from the working group three, the mitigation group of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, showing both the historic um, anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions on the left and the current present day um, greenhouse gas emissions on the right. And the figure on the left is not a surprise to anybody. Um, Europe and North America, followed by Eastern Asia, uh, the world regions which have contributed the most to um, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and as we've already been looking at, um, the places where they're the most affected by climate impacts, uh, many of those places that um, have had a less of a contribution, Africa, South and Southeast Asia. If we look at the present day, perhaps it's even more striking. Um, if we think about what would be a sustainable level of greenhouse gas emissions, of course we need to move towards net zero. Um, but if we're looking at a fair distribution of um, what would be perhaps more achievable, maybe perhaps two tonnes per year per person um, would be more or less sustainable. And we see that many countries, um, North America, Australia, Japan and New Zealand, the emissions per capita are seven, eight or even ten times what would be a global fair share average. And of course, these are places with relatively small populations. The width of the bar indicates the size of the population. And so we can see that there are many places, Southern Asia and Africa, with much larger populations, much lower per capita emissions. And this has implications for how we um, go into global, <clears throat> global policy, including at the, um, at the COP, the Framework Convention on Climate Change, um, to look at the distribution of responsibilities and then the distribution of impacts. So these greenhouse gas emissions that have um, come about over the last couple of hundred years um, then interact with the urban environment to create particular changes in the urban, cli um, in, in the urban climate. So we know the broad parameters of future climate change increased temperatures, um, changes in rainfall patterns, higher sea levels. And we can see how these interact with the changing urban environment as we have changes in the built form, um, uh, in the built environment, the built form, uh, the urban plans, design and layout of cities combined with changes in the climate to create particular impacts. So the form of cities geometry um, the planning and design and the um, presence or absence of green spaces and the type of density, the human activities that take place in cities, um, and then the properties of buildings and the built environment in cities all mean that the local effect on temperature um, in urban areas will be much greater um, than the global averages. So cities are going to experience more higher temperatures um, than other parts of the, the non-urbanised parts of the world. The form of the built environment in cities, which affects drainage and runoff, also means that um, intense rainfall events are more likely to lead to flooding in cities. Um, and the fact that many cities are located in low-lying areas and the coastal areas means that sea level rise will have a particularly significant effect on many cities as well. So the point here really is that we can't see the process of urbanisation and the process of climate change taking place in isolation from each other, but that they combine to produce certain specifically urban impacts that we need to deal with. And the way in which those impacts are experienced will vary. Not everybody is equally vulnerable. Not everyone has the same level 
of risk from climate change. And for people who work on disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation, they'll be very familiar with this broad equation that says risk is an outcome both of the hazard, the exposure to the hazard, and the vulnerability of the people who are exposed. So the experiences of somebody who is living in a well-constructed house which has a functioning seawall and sea defences will be very different from the experiences of the people in, who live in the locations in these images here. The one on the left in South Africa in the outskirts of Durban next to a riverbank, the one in the right in um, uh, Sorsogon, a city in the uh, Philippines. Um, so the combination of the, uh, the exposure to the hazard and the pre-existing vulnerability is what creates risk. And this has spatial dimensions and as urban scholars, I think we all are very accustomed to thinking about um, space and the spatial dimensions as the links between society and space. Also has individual dimensions and there are characteristics of individuals which make people more or less at risk from climate impacts. People who are elderly or who have pre-existing health conditions are far more likely to become ill or die as a result of extreme temperatures and heat waves. Um, children, particularly infants under five, are far more likely to become ill, seriously ill or die as a result of communicable or vector-borne diseases, which may be spread more um, through these changes in the climate. And as I mentioned before, I'm particularly interested here in informality. And if we think about how these different key risks in cities around temperatures, flooding, water scarcity and other dynamic interactions interact with the built environment and the social conditions in low income and informal settlements. We see how people living in these settlements are going to be at much more risk. So if we look at higher temperatures and the effect of the urban heat island, low income settlements that are very dense, houses that are poorly constructed or uninsulated experience much higher inside temperatures than houses which are air conditioned or that have um, a better built, <clears throat> better insulation or are built better. And there's some very interesting research that's been done on heat in a range of places um, that shows how um, the, um, the poor quality, the internal temperatures in poor quality housing are so much more than the internal temperatures in houses that are, are built um, much better. There's also for low income people in cities, a loss of productivity. Um, people who live in informal settlements or work in the informal economy are more likely to be earning their income from activities which can be negatively affected by high temperatures or extreme weather events. Um, if people are informal laborers, um, if people are doing things like pulling rickshaws, um, then these are activities where there's a choice between um, continuing to work and really putting one's health at risk or um, slowing down or reducing work and putting the income and well-being of yourself and your family at risk. Um, urban flooding, informal settlements are more likely to be flooded, not just because of their location, although many informal settlements are on marginal land in coastal areas or on riverbanks, but also because of the lack of infrastructure. And again, this is very evident that in many in many cities, waterfront locations are very, um, very desirable um, for people who can afford to live in well-constructed homes and where the protective infrastructure is solid. Um, but if no income neighbourhoods are in those same sorts of locations, they're very often um, not, um, you know, not um, uh, supported by the same form of um, risk reducing um, infrastructure. <clears throat> it's good to see the comment coming in and um, thank you, um, Francisco. I can certainly um, pick up on that um, later on. <clears throat> The final dimension of the challenge that I want to, um, uh, to to pose is the capacity of cities to respond. And again, I think many of us who work on urban issues um, and um, uh, concerned with uh, municipal governance 
to think about what are the capacities of local authorities to invest to reduce risk. Um, and um, of course, that varies greatly from place to place. And so, of course, there are some cities, Rotterdam, where I'm sitting, where the uh, municipal authority has a very strong capability to invest in risk reduction infrastructure and where the national and municipal institutions have a great deal of experience in reducing risk from flooding and sea level rise, uh, particularly. But of course, many of the places where the people who are most at risk live um, don't have this capacity to invest and are also the places that more often um, experience disasters from extreme weather. And these are places where a significant proportion of the world's urban population, perhaps one to two billion people, live in cities with very little adaptive capacity or some adaptive capacity. So any response to the multiple challenges associated with climate change really does need to take into account this diversity in the experiences um, and cap capabilities um, of municipal governments and citizens um, to respond. So what then needs to be done? <clears throat> um, there is a time limited opportunity for action. Um, and cities and urban areas are critical spaces to take action to respond to the planetary emergency around climate change. Um, they're places that can respond simultaneously to mitigation and to adaptation to reducing global greenhouse gas emissions, while at the same time reducing the risks from the unavoidable climate change impacts that we will experience. It's a time limited opportunity because we need to reach net zero as soon as we possibly can. And because the impacts of climate change, which are already being felt, will um, extend and worsen over time as well. So the opportunity then needs to be to achieve just adaptation and just mitigation. So mitigation being the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, requiring transitions and transformations around the production and use of energy, around transportation, around the economy, around housing, um, and around the overall um, governance um, that, is, um, um, that, that shapes the responses in all of these areas. And adaptation being preparing for climate change adjusting natural and human systems in response to actual or expected climatic stimuli to moderate harm or exploit beneficial opportunities. So as we've been thinking through myself and colleagues, what does this actually mean in practice? Um, we think that we um, need to um, adapt different sorts of infrastructure and that none of these on their own is going to be sufficient, um, but each of them is necessary. And we thought about three particular forms of infrastructure that require adaptation, physical infrastructure, social infrastructure, and, nat and natural infrastructure. And all of these are particularly significant in urban areas, and all of these have benefits, not just for reducing risk, but also for achieving broader benefits of resilience and inclusion for the population. So to start with perhaps the more traditional approach um, around adapting the physical infrastructure of cities, housing and building design and construction, energy infrastructure, IT infrastructure, transportation, water and sanitation, coastal management, all of these are the physical infrastructure which is essential to making urban systems and urban areas function. All of these have particular benefits for low income groups who need to be more included within the benefits of the city. So in many cities and including in the, the including in the Caribbean, but in, in many places around the world, um, basic service infrastructure for low income groups is not adequate and if it's there, it may not be affordable. 
Um, I had colleagues who recently did research in Tanzania that highlighted that many households were spending 30% or more of their household income just on purchasing safe water for the family. So improvements in water and sanitation infrastructure to adapt to climate change can contribute to broader inclusion goals um, to bring in people with safe water and sanitation um, facilities. Safer housing, better building. Um, housing is significant both for shelter and for livelihoods. Um, people, again, particularly people working in the informal economy, often rely on their home as the basis for where they make their livelihoods as well. Um, small scale manufacturing, small, um, small scale retail um, and various other activities um, that take place in the in the home. And also the importance of public infrastructure for low income groups. We find in cities from Lagos to many South Asian cities that wealthier groups are able to purchase some of the infrastructure provision privately. But public infrastructure is particularly important for inclusion um, and for supporting the livelihoods of low income groups. So all of these different elements of the physical infrastructure, which are critical to an urban response to the climate crisis, but that need to be seen alongside social infrastructure. And social infrastructure can be interpreted very broadly from land use planning um, to livelihoods and social protection to the health infrastructure, um, which can uh, both prevent um, help prevent um, the people from becoming ill, you know, address some of the public health challenges, and at the same time help people to get better when they um, when they do become ill. I'll just talk a little bit more, I suppose, about livelihoods and social protection, because this really is one of the areas where there's been a lot of discussion about how um, live, how social protection schemes can become more responsive to climate impacts, um, particularly in urban areas. And it's historically been very different, been very difficult for um, organisations, for particularly for governments, to provide adequate social protection to low income urban residents. And there have been all sorts of barriers around residency requirements and, um, and residency documents. But it's being recognised um, that enabling people to take short term actions to reduce risk and to respond rapidly um, to, um, hazardous, to hazards when they do take place is a critical social infrastructure um, way of helping people to adapt to climate change. And the third dimension of infrastructure that some of us have been looking at um, is around natural infrastructure, nature based solutions or ecosystem based adaptation. Um, and there's been a lot of attention paid recently, and I've seen several events taking place at COP27 that have been talking about the significance of uh, natural infrastructure. Um, for responding to climate change in cities. I suppose the first thing that I would want to stress is that nature based solutions or ecosystem based adaptation is just one of several tools that can be used and that it certainly does have some advantages to other types of infrastructural investments and um, that we have seen. But at the same time, those of us who have worked on urban development are very familiar with the situations whereby elite political and social elites um, can capture many of the benefits of nature, um, of green spaces for themselves, and it doesn't necessarily lead to greater inclusion. So I would you know, caveat the um, importance of natural infrastructure with the, with the um, qualification um, that it is a tool which also needs to be critically examined as to how decisions are made about its implication and who are the winners and losers from its implication, uh, from, its, um, uh, from, from putting it into place. Where it's done well, um, natural infrastructure can have really good benefits for low income groups. Ecosystems can buffer communities and infrastructure from hazards. Um, and can be particularly useful in places where there are fewer other options for 
um, buffering people from hazards or achieving things like um, urban cooling. And so um, natural infrastructure really has been demonstrated as being effective in temperature regulation, air quality regulation, stormwater regulation, coastal flood protection, river flood protection, water provision and management, food protection and security. Um, and I see the comment from Elliot there about stormwater regulation being uh, very uh, relevant <clears throat> and thinking about um, the distribution of impacts from um, from hurricanes. <clears throat> but not, none of this is going to take place without um, uh, appropriate financial, uh, adequate and appropriate financial measures being made available um, to cities and to people in living, in living in cities to respond to climate change. Um, I see there's a comment already from Cathy about funds, um, and I definitely want to come back to that later. But funding is one of the parts of the equation. And the challenge with funding has been that very often the framework for international climate finance, firstly, it's been inadequate. Um, the amounts committed haven't matched the amounts of the scale of need, and the amount that has actually been delivered doesn't match the scale of the amounts that were committed. But even when climate finance is made available, it's often inefficient or ineffective in the way that it's applied. There's often, as uh, my colleagues, um, and you can follow the reference if you're interested, uh, as my colleagues um, argued, climate finance was often very much um, done through primary investors going through intermediaries at an international and national government and a project development level. And at each stage, these intermediaries siphon off more and more of the finance, meaning that the available resources at the end are not meeting the needs of the people who are most affected. So there's while there's very clear accountability to the top, to where the funding comes from, there's much less accountability to the bottom as to where people are ghost going to be affected and can um, react appropriately if there's adequate support. So the argument here is that in very many urban centres, cooperatives, savings groups, grassroots organisations have formed ways of managing funds for local development projects that can be done in a more cost effective way with a greater buy-in and commitment and ownership from uh, the people who are most affected. Um, and that this can be the most effective way of responding to climate change as well. So moving towards a climate finance system which has fewer intermediaries and which is more responsive to the needs of the people who are most affected, including in urban areas. There's a caveat to this as well, which is to look at the role of municipal finance and municipal governments in investing to reduce climate risk. Um, and another element of the climate finance challenge is that very often this is not accessible to subnational levels of government um, because of the restrictions that are placed on municipal governments by the national treasury. What we want to move towards though is climate adaptation that contributes to climate resilient development. Um, and this is from the summary um, of the uh, IPCC sixth assessment, where again we looked at the different ways in which some of these climate adaptation solutions don't just um, reduce climate risk, but also provide a range of social, economic and environmental benefits. Um, and sometimes these are negative relationships. As you can see, very often grey or physical infrastructure can be harmful in terms of the um, urban ecology. And it's certainly not at all flexible once it's been implemented. But when we think about some of these planning, social policy and nature based interventions, the way in which they can also contribute to social capital, enhanced health, reducing poverty and marginality, boosting livelihoods, um, and also have co-benefits with reducing green um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. We can see 
a pathway towards more climate resilient development that uses some of these climate adaptation interventions as the basis to achieve this sort of positive change. <clears throat> That's not always the case. <clears throat> there are um, there are pitfalls, um, and again, the uh, the urban the particular urban context means that these unintended consequences of policy changes um, are really um, can be quite significant. So it's very easy to suggest, for example. Um, that improving building standards or making more rigorous infrastructure standards would reduce climate risk. But if this excludes large groups of the population, then it doesn't reduce the risks for the people who cannot afford um, homes and infrastructure um, that would meet these standards. And we know that of the, um, the, the, the billion or so more people who will live in urban areas over the next 20 years, the majority will probably be housed in buildings, in homes that they build themselves. So simply excluding people from formal building standards and formal building regulations is at best a partial element of the solution because it can still exclude many people from the benefits. Similarly, um, risk mapping and vulnerability mapping that legitimates the removal of informal settlements. I think everyone will be familiar with the um, with the situation of low income groups living on riverbanks or living in coastal areas. Very often that's a reflection of an economic reality that means that there is no affordable land in locations which also enables people to access livelihoods. So any mapping of vulnerability that puts in a, a red zone along coastal areas or along rivers needs to be seen alongside the provision of affordable land in appropriate locations for low income groups. <clears throat> there are also issues around the separation of adaptation from reducing other risks and the wide range of risks that people face from fires, from uh, size, um, from earthquakes and seismic activity as physical risks, but perhaps even more so from uh, economic exclusion and marginalization um, that needs to be seen alongside any climate change responses. Climate responses can't be seen in isolation from these other risks that people face. And nature-based solutions can play a significant role, but also need to be done in ways that account for people. One of the things I think is interesting, though, um, is that um, the global scientific community has recognised the importance of adapting informal settlements and has also recognised that many of the lessons that have been learned from engaging with organised groups um, in cities can be relevant to other situations in trying to tackle complex problems, including the complex problems um, called, um, arising from climate change. So the use of local knowledge building capacity, active engagement of policymakers with citizens, active involvement of residents in decision making and broader institutional changes um, that strengthen accountability, commitment and transparency. All of these are lessons that have been learned from working on climate adaptation in low income and informal settlements that are then much more um, relevant, uh, that much more broadly relevant across a range of challenges. <clears throat> At the same time, and as I started off with, one of the key challenges is the inequality in the contribution to climate change, in the drivers of climate change, and the need both to the parallel need to greatly reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but to do so in a way that delivers socially just and environmentally sustainable outcomes. So feed in tariffs, um, solar, gen solar power generation, an incredibly important component of um, achieving a lower carbon energy grid. But the sort of solar panels that we see in the picture on the right is all well and good if you have a large home with a large and well constructed roof. But for many people in cities around the world, the picture on the left is more representative of their current um, electricity access. Um, 
uh, unpredictable, expensive and frequently dangerous. Having said that, I think this is somewhere where there is really interesting developments, both around micro generation and micro grids. Um, if I can pick a positive outcome from the COVID pandemic, um, I used to probably five or six times a year spend time in informal settlements in Africa or Asia and then stopped entirely for two and a half years. And going back to informal settlements in um, uh, south in, in, in Zimbabwe, in Kenya and in Nepal in the last few months, <clears throat> I really have been struck by the rapid expansion in small solar um, and battery technology, including for low income groups. So we need a transition to greener sources of electricity, but it needs to be done in a way which is affordable and accessible to low income groups. Another challenge around the reducing emissions from solid waste, with methane being one of the um, uh, key climate change gases. Um, the picture on the right is typical in many low income cities of people who are picking through waste. This is an unpleasant and unhealthy way to earn a living, but it does represent a source of livelihoods for millions of people around the world. You can, of course, have waste to energy um, or methane flaring from landfill sites. How can that be done in ways that remembers that there are people who have been dependent on waste for their livelihoods? How do you move to a system which is safer and more healthy for the people who have been involved, but at the same time doesn't just remove them from their source of livelihoods entirely? So these are some of the conundrums and challenges how to have low carbon measures around energy, around waste, around transportation, um, which remain, which meet the needs of low income groups in cities at the same time as contributing to lower carbon futures. <clears throat> so there are ways of having more just adaptation planning and of taking climate change action that reduces inequality. We can do adaptation planning in ways that prioritizes the needs of marginalized populations. If we think about the different domains of justice, the procedural, the distributional, the recognitional um, uh, aspects of justice, prioritizing the needs of low income groups through broadening their participation in an urban adaptation planning process is clearly significant. We need to do just adaptation planning in ways that cuts across from larger and more wealthy cities to smaller and lower capacity and less wealthy cities and secondary cities. There are some global mechanisms and networks which are very good at sharing information between leading cities and large cities. We need to move beyond this to covering more cities in more places. This needs to be supported by appropriate policy and planning tools that are used at different levels of governance, governance at different levels and different scales. Um, and this includes um, having national urban policies that provide the framework for um, cities to um, address policy and planning um, in ways that takes account in the needs of marginalized groups. And um, that challenges some of the historic assumptions around large scale master planning. And again, maybe this is pointing at our own community of um, urban planners and urban geographers has had a tendency to see large scale master planning as being the way to shape cities of the future, instead of recognizing that community planning, of course, within an integrated framework, um, but that bottom up and community planning has a significant role to play both in uh, broader processes of urban development as well as in ad addressing climate change risk. This is an outcome of research that um, colleagues and I did in Nairobi, um, where we looked at the five key dimensions that low income groups felt were vital to improving their own well being neighborhood development and neighborhood infrastructure, livelihoods, housing, transport, and energy. And we started from the perspective of looking at what people um, needed and wanted 
from the places that from the city that they lived in. And then we looked at how climate action could both uh, con how taking a climate sensitive approach could enhance the accessibility and the performance of these different dimensions and also how a developmental approach, a grassroots driven developmental approach um, to each of these sectors could also help to achieve climate goals. And so the quality of housing and that can both make houses more comfortable to live in, but can reduce the um, energy usage within those homes. The quality of livelihoods um, where the circular economy um, and new forms of um, uh, energy technologies can create jobs for people in ways that also um, contribute towards a lower carbon future. Uh, transportation, of course, uh, many low income groups everywhere um, rely heavily on non motorized transport. But how can we have a better transportation system that is affordable to low income groups and also um, doesn't come with increased um, increased emissions? Some of this fits in within broader processes of urban planning, the location of settlements for um, for people, the location of housing. How can we plan in ways that means that people are less dependent on long distance carbon intensive transport to access urban services and to access employment? So we can begin to put together um, a sense of um, climate resilient development pathways, um, planning processes that contribute to adaptation and to reducing marginalization and climate action that reduces inequality. <clears throat> so we can transform cities. We can transform cities uh, which are going to be the home to two thirds of the world's population by 2050. Um, we can do that by bringing together nature based and hard engineering that takes into account green and blue spaces, that brings in things like urban agriculture and the social safety nets, the social protection schemes to help people manage, cope and respond to threats. We can transform cities to respond to climate change in ways that brings broader benefits, benefits to public health, benefits to well-being, benefits to the livelihoods of people living in cities and the contribution to bigger global goals around ecosystem and biodiversity conservation. And we can do that by responding at multiple scales. So on the left is a community meeting in an urban centre in Kenya. People being involved in taking decisions at the local scale um, that um, respond to their own priorities <clears throat> and where their own skills are taken into account and their own needs are prioritised. It needs policy responses at the level of the municipality. Um, this is the town hall, the Jarente, um, for the uh, municipal government here in Rotterdam, where I live. We need a municipal government system which is, which is both given accountability and responsibility for taking charge of many of the issues which relate to how people engage with the built environment in cities. And we need a global framework. Um, we need a global climate framework that takes cities seriously, um, that takes the capacity for urban and subnational governments seriously and provides resources to support cities in responding to climate challenges. And we need a global policy, a global legal framework which is responsive to the particular challenges um, and responses that can take place in cities. And these need to come together. There needs to be a voice for citizens and a voice for municipal governments um, at the COPs and the Framework Convention. And there needs to be accountability for the decisions that are taken um, in these global forums towards the people who are most affected and who will really be at the forefront of climate responses. I'm going to close there. Thank you very much for your time and for your attention. Um, thank you also for the comments in the box, which I'm happy to move to, but I'll return to the chair to guide us on how we should manage that. Thank you very much. Wonderful presentation, David. It's amazing uh, to realize that we really live in a global system and how cities 
are really at the core of how massive the impact of climate change can be because it's just a sheer accumulation of people in, in, in a small space, right? And uh, now you see all these TV programs and movies and shows depicting all the tragedies that are us and so forth, and people see it coming and um, sometimes they fail to react. However, I know we have a number of questions there in the, uh, in the chat and we're going to get to them, but I want to open asking you this. Uh, chronic capitalism is usually seen as the culprit for lack of action on environmental measures. Do you believe that the perceived market opportunities in renewable energy and sustainable technology will help to turn capital towards climate mitigation and actually lowering our path to destruction? <laughs> Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you for starting off with such a straightforward question, Elliot. Um, I think it is a necessary part of the solution. I think that um, every lesson that we have about how positive change takes pl place in cities um, recognises that unbridled market forces left to themselves do not meet the needs of all people, particularly not of historically marginalised people. If we also look at cities, we can see how um, opportunities in the market are seized on in different ways by people to be part of their solutions. Um, if we see how financial services have transformed in East African cities, for example, with new payment mechanisms, um, or the way in which mobile payment systems have been used by municipal governments to improve um, revenue collection, um, or the way that some of the <clears throat> uh, better aspects of the sharing economy have been used um, to achieve um, uh, more efficient you know, use of, um, of scarce resources. So where some of these um, market, uh, you know, new technologies and market driven opportunities can be taken on board for people and they're often taken on board in innovative in un and unintended ways um, by people. <clears throat> At the same time, uh, we know that left to itself, market forces are not going to provide affordable land to um, low income groups. Um, to, to live in locations where they can access livelihoods. And there's nothing fundamentally wrong with mark, you know, the, 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 the countries and places which claim to be the most um, enthralled to the free market are also places that have intervened in the market um, through rent controls and subsidies and social housing. Um, these are not seen as fundamentally undermining the, the market, but as being a necessary way of harnessing market forces or limiting their worst excesses and i think that's going to have to be um to be to be part of the picture wonderful let's move on i see we had a question early on from francisco javier in terms of our cities taking the lead in claiming loss and damage uh, reparations do you want to elaborate on that yeah, I mean, so if you've been uh, anyone who's been following the um, uh, the, the COP discussions um, has that loss and damage is really um, one of the big issues on the agenda in Sharm El Sheikh, um, and getting it on the agenda is significant. It's a, a recognition of that historic responsibility um, and the very present um, experiences. Um, cities have not been taking the lead. Um, on this. Um, and there are several reasons why they haven't, but also several reasons why they should. Uh, one of the main reasons why they haven't, um, certainly my reading, is that the, um, the loss and damage agenda has been highlighted by many of the least developed countries in the climate negotiations, particularly the, the LDC group, the G77 plus um, China. Um, and in many of those countries, the urban dimensions are not taken as seriously as they perhaps need to be. Many of the least developed countries are still 20, 30 percent urbanized. 
and urbanizing extremely rapidly, um, but haven't been fully engaged with an, with an urban agenda. Um, the reason why cities perhaps should be more at the forefront um, is because the um, the quantifiable impacts of climate change are perhaps strongest on urban infrastructure, um, on um, on urban housing. Um, although again, much of that is the um, the infrastructure and assets of low income groups, um, and so the. Uh, the challenge as well in dealing with loss and damage in urban areas is whilst you may be able to quantify the loss of a formally constructed building or a piece of infrastructure like a highway or a bridge, um, it doesn't help you very much in quantifying the losses of uh, uh, homes that are constructed outside formal regulations or outside the formal areas for, for, for land use. So that's a conundrum. Um, for, for the, around the recognition of informality and whether that can then be recognised as being a, a le legitimate loss and damage. And speaking of COP27, how do you react to the recent announced investments uh, from rich countries into climate change mitigation and renewable energy infrastructure for poor countries? Uh, how much more is needed to for that to make a difference in the lives of, of uh, poorer countries? So the um, the need is this big. Mm. The recognized need, the so-called 100 billion, is this big. The money that's committed by countries is this big. Uh, the amount that's been delivered is this big. <laughs> and the amount that has actually reached the places where it's needed most is this big. At every stage, there is a squeezing from the scale of the, uh, the acknowledged scale of need um, to where it actually reaches. So I would say that the challenge is twofold. One is around the total numbers that are committed um, and then delivered. But secondly, it is around the, um, the delivery mechanisms which are made more targeted and more accountable. So I think one of the key things here, um, and um, maybe this comes a little bit to Cathy's question about going beyond funds. Um, many municipal governments either, well, in the first place, many of them are not um, legally able to um, to, uh, you know, to to access funds of different sources. They don't have the, um, the fiscal autonomy um, that's necessary. Um, you know, they're um, they e either to access these funds as grants or loans or to issue things like their own green bonds, um, which can play an important role here as well. So a lot of the um, capacity is around, um, some of it is granting capabilities to municipal governments, and some of it is enhancing the capacity of municipal governments to manage funds and implement projects um, effectively. And there are interesting initiatives. There is a, um, a, a city climate readiness facility which tries to support municipal governments in that. And there is also, I think, a role there for um, where, particularly where local governments lack the full capacity for working in partnership with non-state actors. Um, and again, some very uh, you know, positive examples in different places where um, uh, community organisations and municipal governments work together to reduce risk rather than being in conflict. I mean, I think often social movements have operated in conflict with municipal governments, have demanded services, have demanded changes. There is a role for um, agitation and advocacy um, but if the municipal government lacks the funding and the capacities, you can make all the demands that you like. If they don't have the capacities and funds to deliver, um, then you're not going to be successful in getting a change. So I think some of these things are around engaged non-state actors working with municipal actors to use what funds there are in an effective way. Actually, that brings us to uh, <coughs> Richard Gutierrez's question, right? You, you were mentioning first the contract in terms of the global entities and 
monies, big monies and whatever, then you were talking about states, then cities, and then actual non-state actors like community-based organizations. But what about personal agency? Richard is asking about how we can actually bring proper education on climate change to the people so that they assume personal responsibility, and particularly in uh, mm. in cities with high poverty rates where people may be more concerned with surviving the day than uh, being uh, a, a global citizen in terms of the environment. Yeah, um, and I mean, I think this um, applies across mitigation and and adaptation. Um, I mean, in 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 my experience, um, people are often very aware of the local hazards that they face, um, and are um, making difficult decisions and trade-offs between things like affordability um, and um, um, and um, access to services and access to livelihoods. Um, so I think the the first is uh, I, I think I would challenge the basic assumption that people are not concerned, um, and um, with with the um, with the response that we um, that planners and researchers and academics um, need to first of all listen to find out what people's concerns actually are and to find out them the in which situations concerns do um, align and um, in which situations there are indeed um, tensions because I'm yeah, in certain circumstances there are um, there are indeed tensions um, there is the um, significance again and um, uh, Richard's question speaks about societies where there is more poverty um, the societies where there is more poverty often have a, an age distribution uh, pyramid with a very high proportion of young people. Um, and um, I think that um, engaging directly with with young people is um, a critical way of um, reaching the um, reaching the societies. On the on the mitigation side, it's perhaps even more tricky because it's something where uh, people don't see their own benefits from changing their actions as immediately. Um, I mean, if you if you have a better constructed house or if you're a, if you're no longer experiencing flooding, you experience that yourself immediately. Whereas actions that you take to reduce emissions um, don't benefit you directly. Um, and I think the um, you know, finding ways to communicate both the importance of individual action and personal responsibility, but also the need to engage in processes of um, political change um, where you know, it's, you, we, need, we need people to take public transportation where it's available, but we also need people to be campaigning and voting for um, the politicians who are going to make public transport um, an accessible and affordable reality. So the, the balance between the individual responsibility and the structural changes for mitigation, I think is perhaps one of the big challenges. And I mean, by, by naming it and by beginning to engage with it, it has to be the starting point. Wonderful. Alexis uh, uh, Garcia uh, would like you to share your views on how information and knowledge management strategies could support sustainability action and governance at the city level. Yeah, and another really, um, a really good question, um, and one where I think that there's a mixture of both the um, the the potential of some new technologies um, and the um, need to use some tried and tested um, tried and tested methods. Um, so knowledge, um, well, generating information, generating data, um, and then turning it into useful knowledge uh, has a really helpful role in um, driving action, you know, making people aware of the situation and driving action at the different scales of governance and then accessing and financing. And so, I mean, there is potential around some of these you know, big data things around air quality monitoring, temperature monitoring, 
um, around um, providing uh, providing uh, information digitally to across the entire population, um, ways of early <clears throat> early warning systems for um, for floodings or heat waves, spreading information about um, uh, cooling centres that people can go to in a heat wave. So there's a lot of ways in which um, new technologies can support the generation and use of data to um, to reduce risk. There's some more fundamental things though as well, um, and um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Alexis's question asks um, about examples. Um, there's a program called Know Your City, um, KYC Know Your City, which is um, run by uh, networks of um, residents of informal settlements globally, which is a much more basic set of information gathering, um, primarily around access to basic services, access to land and access to housing, which is beginning to show its potential for responding to climate change as well. And this is community generated data at the household scale. Um, and it does become digitized, but it relies, it takes advantage of um, and recognizes uh, the networks and relationships within communities and neighborhoods. Um, that there is um, a limit to, you know, how do you how do you assess the whether somebody is a legitimate resident of a neighborhood? and therefore entitled to relief following a disaster or entitled to subsidies to improve the quality of their home. Community generated data collected by people who know and trust their neighbors and where that data is shared and verified at the neighborhood scale is in many ways not what we think of when we think of big data and new technologies and new knowledge, um, but is pretty fundamental around assessing the rights and capabilities and needs within cities, which then leads to more accountable governance. Um, people although, can, governments can, yeah. Although sometimes that, that has to do also, it's impacted by rules and regulations. Here after Hurricane Maria, FEMA refused to help many, many families because they didn't have a property title to the house they had built legally, if you will, in a part of land that nobody had claimed. So you're not the legal owner, therefore your house was destroyed, it wasn't yours to begin with, you don't have any right to a benefit. And many thousands of families have suffered because of that. So in a, in a not dissimilar, you know, a very distant, but not dissimilar geographical context, some of the best positive examples I've seen are in the Philippines, um, where, um, the um, NGOs and communities have been proactive in this sort of mapping and in the absence of other um, documents, um, the municipal government, the barangays, the smallest um, municipal authority and then the city governments have come to recognize and trust this form of mapping in the absence of better documented formal tenure and documentation systems. Um, and of course, the when I say a similar disaster context, the Philippines as a you know as well an archipelagic state, but with a lot of coastal settlements um, and um, experience in many um, many cyclones. I think um, has that sort of experience um, and the you know these these the, the this model for community enumeration that over time has begun to be trusted by the authorities. Um, I think is a, a positive example there. OK, David, uh, thank you so much for this amazing presentation. We have all learned so much from it, particularly getting a more global perspective on the threat and the solutions that are coming about. I would like to ask uh, Dr. Francisco Javier Carrillo to join us for a second uh, to say hello to you, to the audience. He's the president of the World Capital Institute, for those of you who don't know him. And um, Javier, do you want to turn on your camera and mic so people can see you? Hello, everyone. Good morning. Uh, just uh, congratulations, everyone. So glad to have you all here. David, brilliant presentation. Thank you so much. I think you, it was a wonderful start to get us uh, engaged into uh, thinking how we can come out of this conference 
more enabled to uh, be more active and more efficient in doing our part towards uh, uh, facing this huge existential challenge of the climate emergency. So thank you so much. Brilliant start. And uh, just uh, welcome to everyone. I'm delighted to see uh, as many participants and I hope everyone uh, feels this uh, th th as their space for learning, for sharing and uh, for uh, working together uh, for uh, our planet. So uh, I also want to take the opportunity to thank and congratulate the University of Puerto Rico and the whole team laid by Elliot and uh, Natalie and uh, Natalie uh, for the, their wonderful job. And uh, so just uh, uh, to everyone, uh, let's make the most of this opportunity to uh, 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 potentialize our uh, response capacity to do our part. Welcome. Thank everybody. you so much, Javier. And uh, as we come to a close, I would like to remind everyone that you need to always tackle and look at the program of the conference, which is on the website of our faculty. It's on the chat. And uh, I also posted there the link for the next session. Remember, each individual session has its own link, its own Teams meeting. And uh, we uh, encourage you to get in there and uh, make the most of all the sessions that you can attend because this is really an intellectual banquet that we are enjoying here these three days. Again, um, I want to thank Dr. David Dodman for his extraordinary contribution to KCWS 2022 and to all of you for attending this session. We are going to close a bit early to give you an opportunity for a bathroom break and uh, to stretch your legs before you move on to the next uh, session, which our dear friend, Dr. Kathy Garner, is going to be hosting on climate crisis, knowledge in action, and the speakers will be Professor Siku Yuhola, Immaculata Omoyola, and Beth Caniglia. See you there. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, David.